Like I said, I'm going to talk a little bit more about water balance and pH balance. Uh, this is kind of like the perfect, the best time to talk about that. And then I'm also going to just spend a few moments talking about dialysis, what, you know, what kidney dialysis is, the artificial kidney, just so you can have a context for that. Um, okay. of water balance. So the basic idea is like, there's the person. Right, and if you are in water balance, you are not either inflating and becoming a big water balloon and you are also not shriveling up and becoming some dried out husk and blowing off in the wind. You know, but as we know, you know, water is always leaving. So we have water coming in, we have water going out, and it has to be in balance or else you are going to inflate up like a water balloon or dry out like a little husk. Um, in general, the amount coming in and out every day is usually about two and a half liters per day. You're taking in about two and a half liters, you're losing about two and a half liters, and overall you're staying in equilibrium. So just wanted to mention a little bit about that process. You know, we, and obviously it's going to depend on the person exactly what proportions, but we'll just kind of give like what are kind of normative values, like where does the water come from that you are adding into the plus side of this equation. Oral consumption. Yeah, so, you know, fluids. Right. I mean, that's typically the majority of the positive side of the water balance are from fluids. You know, usually it's somewhere around 60% or whatever. You know, obviously it's going to depend on you and your diet and everything. Where else does the positive side of the water equation come from? Cellular respiration. Yeah, remember I just talked about with the uh, kangaroo rat? They don't drink at all. They get all the water they need from cellular respiration. Remember, remember um, C6H12O6 plus O2 becomes six H2Os, you know, plus six carbon dioxide plus ATP. But that water is not insignificant. So um, cellular respiration is another important. You know, you know, not a lion's share, but you know, maybe 10% of your overall water that adds into the positive side of the ledger every day is actually coming from that water coming from, you know, cellular respiration. You know, and the rest is just thick in your food. Right, you know, when you're eating an apple, that apple actually has a lot of water in it, or unless you're eating some cracker dust, most of your food has some kind of water. So now we add, you know, solid foods. Solid food, maybe 30%. So that, that should make kind of sense. You've got majority from fluids, more from the solid foods that have water content, and then you know, a fair amount actually just from the water that's the byproduct of breaking down sugar to get energy. And then obviously, for every two and a half liters that come in each day, you're going to lose two and a half liters. Um, you know, there, a lot of it, what's going to be the majority of the water you lose every day? Sweat. Actually, not not sweat. Actually, I mean, it depends if you're in a maybe if you're in some super hot place, but you so you do lose through sweat. But it's um, 
In fact, I have here like 8% perspiration. Pers per 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 Obviously, that number is totally made up because it depends how hot it is outside and all that. But in general, the amount of water you lose through your sweat glands for water, for temperature control is not the major place you lose water. We just talked about exhaling. Um, or yeah. That was in the lab, through exhalation and through urinating. So urinating. So urinating is the most most of it. So maybe I'd say like 60% through urination. Um, the, obviously the amount you pee is going to depend on your body's needs, which again, we're going to see in the lab today. Um, You know, typically it's around one and a half liters or so, right? So we go from like 150 liters of filtrate per day and reabsorb 99% of that volume, both in the PCT, in the loop of Henley, and in the collecting duct. Remember, when we got to the collecting duct, we were still around 20, 20 mils per minute or so. Usually by the end of the collecting duct, you're down to a mil per minute. So, all right, so urination, but then, yeah, someone was saying the breathing. So, so I'm gonna put in here like, you know, 28, again, these numbers are always crack me up, but I'll write it anyway, 28%. So by lungs, this is what I mean by breathing. I mean, but you know, just the exhale has more water than the inhale had. Skin, you evaporate through your skin, not that much, but a little bit. Um, in, you know, if you remember from anatomy, your skin has these glycolipids and stuff that waterproof it and everything. You know, if, if you have other, like a frog, a frog literally, if it's just sitting there, it will evaporate as fast as a, you know, hunk of jello or something. Our skin is pretty waterproof. You can be out in the sun and you're not just evaporating out all your fluid, but some, some gets through that skin. Um, and then a little bit more urination, obviously, you, your feces has to have some pliability or else it's a rock and it's not going to actually come out. <laughs> so maybe 4% feces. So obviously among these things, this is the one that we have a lot of control over. So as this plus side is going either up or down, we can adjust this up or down to make sure that the balance is, is maintained. You know, this is the stuff you actually can't control. So this is what we're going to call the insensible water loss. And this is somewhere, you know, I'm going to say like 0.9 liters per day, somewhere around a liter per day where no matter how much your body is trying to preserve water, you know, you can really decrease the amount of urine you're making and all that, but you're always going to lose, you know, about a liter a day. So in this water balance equation, if you don't have any water coming in, you're just going to be becoming more and more and more dehydrated. Your blood's going to become more and more and more sludgy. Um, I think I've mentioned earlier, you, you could go a month if everybody, everybody here could not eat another bite for the next month and you would not be happy, but it'd probably be no long-term consequences of it. 
um because you've got so many stores of energy and stuff like that that you'll do all right but if you tried to not drink any water for one week we'd probably all be dead so yeah so water is is different that way does menstruation have any significance in that because there's some people who are heavy bleeders i don't know if that would count in like water loss absolutely absolutely yeah no because that's you're losing water from your body there um so what else do i want to say about this yeah other i mean other things that caught like diarrhea diarrhea is you know can be deadly if you have really bad diarrhea that's not controlled it can be really hard to keep the patient hydrated because they are they keep losing all this water out the out the backside um you know and you know you have little osmolarity sensors you know in your in your um, hypothalamus that are detecting if your osmolarity of your body fluids is getting too high you know you're going to start getting thirsty and you want to drink and dilute things um i have what do i have here i have oh if you if your plasma plasma osmolarity increases like you know just a couple of percent um that's going to turn on your thirst you know your thirst um centers and say i need to drink i need to dilute things a little more i'm starting to get too concentrated in my body fluids um so that's that's the main thing i just want people to realize that water balance is a thing you know i think some of the stuff where you know you people have these one size fits all like you should be drinking like you know, like six liters of water every day to be healthy. It's like some of that stuff is bizarre, you know. And people even go overboard. People think, "Oh, I'm gonna the more I drink, the healthier I am." If you kind of overwhelm your body's ability to keep the um, osmolarity balanced, you can actually get into these really dangerous situations, like hyper hypo hyponatremia, hypokalemia. They call hyponatremia is your sodium is too low, hypokalemia, your potassium is too low. And then all of your um, voltages across your membranes get all weird, right? So I remember I mean, that happened oh, like a few years ago. And people were like, you know, if you're gonna be taking drugs and dancing all night, make sure you just keep drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking. And like people like, oh, I better just drink and drink and drink and drink. And then they would like actually get into these health crises because they were overly diluted. So you don't want to over, you know, overdo anything. Um, all right, so water balance. Um, the other thing that's related to the kidneys is pH balance. And typically, just like, you know, the classic osmolarity for body fluids is, you know, 280 to 300 milliosmolar, the kind of normative pH for your plasma and body fluids is about 7.4. This is what would be like normal. You know, and then there's a range, you know, and it goes up or down depending on all you know the metabolic processes that are generating acids and bases and stuff in your tissues. You know, we saw just by transporting carbon dioxide and creating carbonic acid, you are making your your um, body more acidic. Or if you hyper hypoventilate, you start make you know, hyperventilate, you make things more alkaline. Um, so. If we go like the 7.45, we are then in alkalosis. Yes, yeah, so maybe I should 
Let me draw that a little differently. Like once, once you are greater than 7.45, it's called alkalosis. The other way, once you are less than 7.35, you're called acidosis. And your body's going to be making, um, making adjustments to try to pull back into the normative range. Um, if you get too far over, I think it's 7.8 or 7. On either side of these is death. Like your nervous system gets either hypo or hyper excited. Um, so these are kind of like the hard boundaries of you don't yeah if 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 you can't pull back and stabilize your ph and they go beyond either less than seven or greater than 7.8 then you know the system is just going to start uh, breaking down you know basically through the signaling of your neurons and things like that so let's talk about we've already mentioned over the semester the three main ways you preserve ph balance so this will be our kind of formal time to just pull them all together and write them all on the board at the same time. What is the kind of instant fast way? If the pH is shifting a little bit, what can help um, keep the pH stable, even if you're adding a little bit of acid or adding a little base? Buffers. Buffers, totally. Like the buffer systems, these are fast, right? They act pretty much instantly because it's just about weak acids and bases dissociating and reassociating. Um, there's the bicarbonate buffer system. Bicarbonate. Um, which is in your plasma. That acts as a buffer. Um, there's phosphate buffers. Um, even amino acids, maybe I just say protein. Proteins can actually act as buffers because some of the amino acids um, have parts that are acids and bases and will either add or subtract to the, um, to the protons in the solution. So proteins can actually help buffer things as well. So thing about buffer systems, is they're really fast, but they have a limit to how much that they can absorb, right? If you have more and more of the weak acid dissociating, at some point you've run out of the raw materials to keep the buffer going. But this is only something that can stop changes, you know, if around some set point, but this is not going to be a kind of the main way you're going to adjust your overall pH. Um, another way to adjust pH we saw in the respiratory system. Right? We saw if you hypoventilate, you're going to have more CO2 building up. What's going to happen to your pH? Hypoventilate, you're not exchanging air that much. It's carbon dioxide is building up in your body. More acidic. More acidic, right? More carbon dioxide means more carbonic acid. So this is going to increase the acidity. You know, in fact, um, so pH can go down by 0.2 you know, by having your, your ventilation. If you just breathe more shallowly, you can, you can bring your pH down quite a bit. 
you know, similarly, if you're hyperventilating, that's going to make things more alkaline, decrease the acidity. You can have the pH go up by 0.2, you know, by doubling your pulmonary ventilation. So just by taking deeper, deeper breaths like that, I can bring my pH up quite a bit. So, you know, swinging around in here, you know, and this, this, you know, takes maybe minutes. It's not as instant as a buffer system, but it's pretty quick. You know, and you have detectors in your medulla. You have detectors actually in your carotid and aortic bodies where they're also kind of monitoring carbon dioxide and stuff like that, that are giving you readouts on the acidity of your plasma and adjusting your breathing actually to pull it into the proper pH range. So part of your breathing is about oxygenating your blood, but part of it is also about making these short-term changes to your pH. You know, obviously this is also not a permanent way to adjust pH because you don't want to like have your breathing forever changed, you know, to keep your pH stable. So then we get to the main long-term control for your baseline pH, which is going to be what? What would it mean if your body is too acidic? What does it mean to be acid, to be acidic? Does it have something to do with the carbon in your bloodstream? What? No, no. Okay. no let's go back, go back to the, what does it mean? Oh, okay, I, I'm, we need to talk about pH again, maybe. Aren't there more H pluses? Yeah, that's it. Remember, it was all about the concentration of H pluses. Remember, we had just in neutral water, it, this concentration of H plus was like 10 to the minus seventh. When this was lower, it's more acidic, I mean, more basic. If you have a higher concentration of H pluses, it's more acid, acid. right? So it's all about the concentration of H pluses. That's why the bicarbonate, remember CO2 plus H2O became carbonic acid, H2CO3, which dissociates H plus by bicarbonate ion. That's the reason why increasing CO2 in your body is making things more acidic overall because you're getting ultimately more H plus in your bloodstream. Less CO2 means less H plus. So that's why things are more alkaline, right? So whenever you think of pH, you got to think about it being this. It's about the carbon dioxide, about the H plus. And then when we think about the respiratory system in particular, CO2 in your plasma because of that carbonic anhydrase, which turns the water and the CO2 into carbonic acid, you know, increased CO2 means increased H plus, which means increased acidity. So, all right, so now we're back to where we were. If your, if your plasma is too acidic, what does that mean? based on definition of what an acid is. Somebody? That there's a high concentration of the H pluses. Yeah, exactly. Right? It means we have more H pluses than we would like. And the thing we want to do is get rid of them. And there's only one way you can actually permanently just 
remove them from your body. And what can do that? What can actually excrete H pluses and just get them out? Urinary system? Yeah, the urinary system. That's, that's what we've been talking about for all this time, right? The urinary system is doing pH balance by either, you know, in that secretion and reabsorption. If you release, you pee out H pluses, you're going to bring down your pH or bring up your pH, I should say. You could also adjust by peeing out more bicarbonates if you're too alkaline. This is ultimately the long-term control of pH. Now, this is going to be over hours, so that's why you need these other systems to do kind of short-term control of the pH balance. But over the big picture, the only way to permanently remove these like metabolic acids from your body is the urinary system. Use your kidneys to you know secrete them into the tubule and ultimately pee them out down into the toilet or wherever they're going to go. So, and that, that is why the pH, you know, normal pH of urine, there is no normal pH of urine. The urine is going to be whatever pH it needs to be to do pH balance. If your body needs is, is too acidic and you need to pee out H pluses, you know, your urine is going to be more acidic. If your body is too alkaline because you've been more of a veggie diet, you might be peeing out bicarbonates, in which case your urine will be more alkaline. Right, so there is there is no correct pH for your urine. It depends what your kidneys do with the H pluses and bicarbonates. Here I'm drawing them in yellow because they're set, they're dissolved in your pee. <laughs> and you know, and then you can actually get them out of your body, which is going to be again the main kind of long-term control. But again, it takes a while for the kidneys to do that processing. So you have these short-term things to make sure you don't get into trouble in the short term. You've got like the buffer systems are almost instantaneous in the respiratory system, which can have pretty dramatic changes in adjusting your, your overall pH. So, any questions about that? But hold on, I have to, I'll be back in one sec. So questions. No questions? No questions. No. Okay. 
The last thing I will talk about, which you're not really responsible for, but I think is worth knowing about, is what is dialysis? What if your kidneys aren't working? So obviously, all the stuff the kidneys are doing is essential to survival. If you don't have the kidneys doing their filtration and secretion and reabsorption, you're going to have buildup of toxins. You're going to have imbalance of all of your ions and mo you know, molecules, your pH, everything's going to kind of go cattywampus. So if you only have one kidney, you're cool. Your kidneys have enough, enough, um, kind of redundant, enough capacity to do all of their work that even if you just have one kidney and it's working well, at least, you'll be fine. That's why people can donate their kidney to somebody else. Um, if your kidneys are not functioning well, and that can happen for lots of different reasons, there's different diseases where you get these weird like kind of cysts and growth in there and this and that, or it can happen from high blood pressure messing things up or diabetes. There's all sorts of things where the kidneys start failing. And if that happens, you need to come up with something to do, take over that job of kind of maintaining the blood. So I'm gonna just briefly talk about dialysis. And I have here, you know, people can be maintained like 15 to 20 years with what we call the artificial kidney, like the dialysis machine that is adjusting their blood. You know, it's not ideal. You know, if you have, let me, if you're on dialysis, even though it's kind of adjusting some basic compositions, it's not doing it in real time and adjusting moment to moment like your real kidneys are. So that means things are gonna be getting out of balance or toxins are gonna be building up till the next time you hook up to the machine. Um, also, you know, it's not gonna be doing a lot of the other cool stuff the kidneys do in terms of regulating, um, regulating your blood pressure or regulating your, um, regulating your red blood cell count and things like that. So ideally you'd rather get a donated kidney than be on dialysis, but it's better to be on dialysis than being dead. <laughs> um, so let me explain how this works. So most of what we've been talking about is, oh, here's some semi-permeable membrane, and we talk about osmosis, like the solutes don't move, but the water does. But in what we're going to talk about in dialysis, dialysis is actually going to be the movement of solutes. We're going to allow solutes to move across the membrane. In which case, solutes, what's going to determine which way a solute moves across a membrane? Assuming that the solute can cross. One concentration gradient. Exactly. So basically, the solute is going to move in the direction that is going to be driven by its concentration gradient. So we're going to basically have this dialysis membrane here. And we are going to be running our blood through this circuit, you know, inside this dialysis membrane. I'll show you how it works in a little bit. And then I'm gonna have this fluid on the outside, it's called dia dialyzing fluid. That silly goose thing. And I'm gonna put basically my target concentrations of whatever I want the blood to equilibrate with. Like I ultimately want no urea left in the blood, 
after this process is done. So that is going to mean in my dialyzing fluid, let's make sure there's zero urea. That way, any urea that's in the blood is going to be moving out into this dialyzing fluid as it equilibrates, goes along its gradient. Um, you know, it's I think it's 133 um, kind of milli equivalents of sodium. You know, what that means is, so this is kind of the target value so these are kind of basically our target values for what we want the blood to look like so that means if the blood is too salty higher than that the salt will leave the blood until it's that that if the blood is too low in salt salt will actually come in until the blood equilibrates to that right so in this dialysis process you put your target concentration of whatever in the dialyzing fluid and then you're going to allow your blood to equilibrate with that target concentration so by the time this process is done and you're done with this you know process your blood will have equilibrated to these target levels that were set by the dialyzing fluid um you know, 125 like mill, milligrams per deciliter of glucose. So there's like certain, you know, I have here all these different things. I have, you know, the, um, the composition of dialyzing fluid has like 133 milliequivalents per liter of sodium, five of potassium, three of calcium, 1.5 of magnesium, 107 of chloride, 27 of bicarbonate, and then like 125 mg per deciliter of glucose and things like that. It's just whatever it is. And the way the machine actually works, there's two types of dialysis. I'll show you the first way. You have your person here. And they're sitting down. You take blood out of one arm. And it goes through this dialysis, these little, and they're actually very, um, they look almost like angel hair or something. So this is all made out of this, this little tubes of, dialy tubes of dialysis membrane. Right, so this, you know, keeps, keep cells in, but it allows small solutes to move. You know, and then it comes back in the other arm. And then we have that in a bath of this dialyzing fluid. And the dialyzing fluid, because you want to make sure it doesn't change. I mean, as things move in and out, it's going to change concentrations. So you actually have a constant flow. So here we got it then. We've got the blood flowing out of this guy through this dial these little tubes of dialysis membrane back into the body. As it's moving through that system, it's going to equilibrate with the dialyzing fluid concentrations of whatever is in there. Again, we're going to keep flowing dialys dialyzing fluid in and out to make sure that it's stable. You know, even if you know, if salt comes in or out of the dialyzing fluid 
as the blood adjusts, it doesn't matter because we've got fresh dialyzing fluid coming in to keep, keep the concentration solid. And then you have to sit here. This is like, you know, four to six hours, um, like three days a week. So this is kind of your classic kidney dialysis. You're sitting there for four to six hours, three days a week, and your blood is going out of your body into this machine where it can equilibrate with the concentrations of the solutes and the dialyzing fluid and get returned into your body. You know, it also means when you're not on dialysis, you gotta be really careful about how much you're drinking and how much salt you're eating and all that because you're not going to have that constant adjustment. Like we're going to see in the lab today that over the course of two hours, just by eating and drinking, your kidneys do all sorts of stuff and adjust how much water and salt you're losing from your body. If you don't have your kidneys working like that and you got to wait for the next day to come in for the machine to do it for you, you got to be really conscious about how much water and salt you're putting into your body because otherwise you're gonna get into trouble. Um, so any questions about this? You're, again, you're not responsible. I'm not gonna put this on a test, I, at least not as a main question, but I do think it's worth understanding what kidney dialysis really is. Um, there's one other version that people use called continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. Probably better, it's gonna be faster if I type it. Um, this one is, is kind of trippy here. I will, I'll draw a little picture for you just so you can see it. So here's our person. So here is their abdominal pelvic cavity. Right, abdominal pelvic cavity, that's where you have all of your intestines and your stomach and all that. And it's all wrapped in the serous membrane called the peritoneum. The peritoneum is what is what is wrapping all that. So people who have this, they put a little spigot that attaches into their peritoneal cavity, their abdominal pelvic cavity. And basically, you put in about like, I think two liters of dialyzing fluid. And then you tie this off. And now ambulatory, this person can walk around while this dialyzing fluid is sloshing around inside there and their blood is equilibrating with this fluid that you dumped into their abdominal cavity. And then after, I have here, after two hours, you know, you just drain the fluid out. You know, so you can do this, you know, you do this like every day. Every night. You put in like this two liters of the fluid, let it equilibrate and drain it out. So that's another way to do it. You don't have to go into, um, you know, there's higher risks of infection because you're constantly putting this stuff into your body cavity and out and all that. But this is another way people deal with um, kidney failure to uh, adjust the blood if you don't have the kidneys working properly. So. All right. Where are we? All right. So yeah, just I realized I could show you.
I drew those kind of pictures, but I actually did a little searching on Google images and just to show you the reality. So like this is, she said, I don't, I don't think people are normally having this good a time while they're in dialysis, but um, here you can see this is where the blood is coming in and out of her body. This machine here is what's kind of pumping the blood in and um, getting rid of bubbles and this and that. This thing right here, this is where the magic happens. This is the little filter, the thing I'm circling right now. Um, you can see there is a red line coming in the top and a red line coming out the bottom. That's the blood coming in and out. And then there are also these other white lines coming in that kind of make the jacket of the dialyzing fluid around. So here I have like, let me back. I can now, let me clear these. You know, this kind of shows what that filter is actually. There's the blood coming in, the top leaving in the bottom. Each of these red lines is the blood contained in a little tube of dialysis membrane. And then this blue is the dialyzing fluid that is just kind of irrigating around and allowing the blood to equilibrate with it. This is showing more of a realistic picture of what they actually look like. Blood coming in and out, going through these little fibers, basically little tubes of dialysis membrane with the dialyzing fluid coming in and out and kind of bathing them. Um, this is even more, this is realistic. This is an actual picture of one of these little cartridges. It's like maybe a foot long or something. It jacks into that, you know, basically jacks into the machine you know, while the person is sitting there as the blood comes in, goes through, equilibrates and back in for like six hours. So just kind of giving you more realistic sense of what that looks like. 